If people understood Tupac's role in the history of hip-hop and in the struggle for black liberation, they would understand why he said this. I got the whole world fear me, you know what I'm saying? At 23, weighing 160 pounds, you know what I'm saying? And I ain't even started. I haven't even wrote my plan out yet, and they scared. I got the vice president know who I am, the president, every cop in every city, you know what I'm saying? And I haven't even started working out a plan. Why was the president, the vice president, and every cop in every city on high alert when it came to Tupac? Vice President Dan Quayle has renewed his attack on Hollywood. Now the target is rap lyrics, which Quayle charges have led to violence. There is absolutely no reason for a record like this to be published uh, by a responsible corporation. Mr. Quayle wants the record taken off shelves. Today, uh, I am suggesting that uh, Time Warner's uh, subsidiary, uh, Interscope Records, uh, withdraw uh, this record. Uh, it has no place in our society. He said, take my shit up off the shelf. Now, if that ain't hitting me, what is? I'm talking about the vice president of the country you live in. He know me. He want my shit up off the shelf. Not mother mega death. Not kill a cop. Uh, all these other mother out there. All these white men. God damn. They came after me. Young pop. You know why? Because my shit is different than the next man. My shit talk about swinging back. They know the difference between mine and the next man. I think one of the great cons that American media has pulled is convincing the general public that Tupac was just another gangster rapper with anger issues. But the rage that Tupac rapped with was in part a prophetic rage about the state of the world, a world he was determined to have a hand in changing. Where do you see yourself in 20 years from now? If God give me breath for 20 more years, I see myself changing the world because my thought patterns are so opposite of what's the norm. So I would have to change the world or I have to be changed by the world. It's, I'm not saying I'm going to rule the world or I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the, the, the brain that will change the world. And that's our job, is to spark somebody else watching us. I was around eight years old. They were shooting a video in my neighborhood in Compton. My father seen him, went two blocks down, got me. By the time he got me, everybody was out there. It was like pandemonium, you know, he put me on his shoulders. And that he was, Dr. Dre and um, Tupac right there, and uh, I think it was a white Bentley. That moment right there, whether I know it or not, subconsciously, I think it eventually branched me off to what I'm doing now. Tupac is um, more than just a, an influencer from an artistic point of view. He, it feels like his spirit is traveling through your records now in many respects, the way that you refer to him and mm -hmm. his deep reference point. Why? This dude impact not only on me, but on the culture. It's something I can never forget, mm. you know, from physically seeing him to hearing him on record, uh, to him applying himself in the community and actually being right there with us. It's just something that I hold dear. I feel like I'm doing God's work because these ghetto kids ain't God's children. And I don't see no missionaries coming through there. I'm up in the hood, you know what I'm saying, doing my work with my folks. I got to go there because I can't hang nowhere else. I will always have that, that sense of reaching a certain standard as far as, you know, empathy and compassion toward a record the same way Pac approached music. It will always be in the back of my head to never forget that. No matter how big the hit record gets, no matter how big the album gets, I always had that compassion and that's why his memory and his legacy in my music will never leave. It'll be interesting to see who you're going to be that same person yeah, for coming yeah. up. Definitely. It's scary too, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, suddenly you feel there's a responsibility. Yeah, it's definitely a responsibility. Me, I'm just a good kid, hoping I can spread love. Word to the county building for help, I do it fun. Yeah, talk city. And that's our job, is to spark somebody else watching us. We, we might not be the ones, but let's not be selfish, and because we're not going to change the world, let's not talk about how we should change it. This is a man who was bald in his early 20s in large part because he was beaten unconscious by the Oakland Police Department for jaywalking. They were charging me with jaywalking. The officers said, you are not above the law. You have to learn your place. Next thing I know, my face was being buried into the concrete, and I was laying face down in the gutter, waking up from being unconscious in cuffs with blood on my face and I'm going to jail for resisting arrest. It's about me being a young black male and I was lynched in broad daylight and then taken to jail for that. So Pac was keenly aware of the struggles in the world around us. For example, if you listen to this Tupac interview from 1994, it's almost like he recorded this yesterday. 
I'm seeing that as a, as a farce. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying I'm bad. It's a farce. I just told you some of the atrocities that this country's been committing in front of our face. If I was this bad guy, how come ain't no corpses with my name on it? You know what I'm saying? How come it's all these corpses with their names on it? You know what I'm saying? Everywhere we go, just look in any country that ain't controlled by America and ask them what America did to them. And I bet you it's going to be some pillaging, raping, taking, snatching, beating, shooting, killing, locking up, beating down, some shit that us thugs ain't even started doing yet. We're grabbing our information from watching America go to Haiti, beat the shit out of motherfuckers kick them out their house and then move their own people in. We watching our America go to, 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 where's that other spot? They just came from Kuwait. Just shoot motherfuckers up, bomb churches and say it's in the name of love and bomb, you know, schools and bomb hospitals and, and just starve whole nations. We watching our America takes they um, armies and they'll surround a whole nation so no food get there to strangle the whole nation, the kids and everybody. Trippy, right? And Tupac had this awareness for a long time, even dating back to high school. And so much of that had to do with his mother, Afeni Shakur, who was a Black Panther and a revolutionary. We're not being taught to deal with the world as it is. We're being taught to deal with this fairyland, which we're not even living in anymore. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sad, because I'm telling you, and it's, it should not be me telling you. It should be common knowledge. Aren't they wondering why um, death rates are going up and suicide is going up and drug abuse aren't they wondering don't they understand you know those little things they have for the mice where they go through around the circle and there's little blocks for it and everything well society is like that they'll let you go as far as you want but as soon as you start asking too many questions and you're ready to change boom this is part of the story of tupac's mother afini shakur her background and how she took on the state of new york and won and she did that while pregnant with her son tupac amaru shakur my mother's my partner she's a soldier you know she's a soldier like i'm a soldier and my mother put mother in. Do you hear me? Yes, my mama was a gun packing. What I'm talking about for you, mother. Excuse me, but my mama put in work. Alice Faye Williams had been born in North Carolina. She had run away from home when she was young because she was frightened of her violent father. And she came to New York when she was 15. She managed to get a place to study at the School of Performing Arts. Then one day, on 125th Street in Harlem, she listened to a speech by Bobby Seale, one of the leaders of the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers believed that the only way to stop racism in America was for black people to get power. So I just made a speech building up to it, building up, building up, building up, showing that it wasn't a question of morality, it wasn't a question of being good or bad, it was simply a question of power. And the we black people had no power. And we had to have some power. The only type of power we could have is black power. Black power. We want black power. We want black power. We want black power. They responded immediately in a healthy manner. Alice Williams decided to join the Black Panthers. She became a member of a new chapter that had been set up in Harlem. And she changed her name to a Faini Shakur. She later explained what the Panthers meant for her. For the first time, she said, there was now something I could do with all this aggression and all this fear inside me. The Panther Party at that time took my rage and channeled it against them instead of against us. They educated my mind and gave me direction. And with that direction came hope. One morning, armed police stormed into Afeni Shakur's apartment and arrested her. All the other members of her cell were also arrested. They were charged with what the government said was a giant plan to destroy those elements of society which the defendants call the power structure. It included attacking police stations and planning to bomb five large department stores and the Bronx Botanical Gardens. They became known as the Panther 21. Their trial was held in a state of paranoia about further attacks by the Panthers. But it also caused a sensation when it was revealed that three of the founding members of the group had been undercover police officers. Unlike all the other Panthers, Afeni Shakur chose to defend herself. And at the end of the trial, she cross-examined the leading undercover agent he was the man she had suspected from the start, Yedwa Sudan. His real name 
was Ralph White. A journalist who was in the courtroom wrote a book that described what happened. She started by getting White to admit that really most of the inspiration for the plots came from the undercover agents. Not only had they continually pushed for the violence and suggested the targets, but they had also arranged to buy the dynamite of yet another undercover agent. They had also arranged for the cars to transport the dynamite. That really, the plot to attack America had been created and driven by the American authorities. But then a Afeni Shakur went further. She talked to White in the courtroom, not as a police officer, but as a comrade that she had spent 18 months with, and asked him about the activism that they had done together in the community. He said that he thought what they had done was powerful, inspiring, and he said, beautiful. She asked if he had misrepresented the Panthers to his police bosses. He said yes. She asked if he had betrayed the community. He said yes. When the jury was sent out, they talked for 40 minutes, came back and acquitted all the defendants. I now play for you the words of her son, Tupac, a product of this legacy of resistance. A man whose deep-rooted desire for us as black people was for our liberation and for our unity. I don't want to be 50 years old at a BET We Shall Overcome um, Achievement Awards. You know what I'm saying? Uh-uh. Not me. You know, I want, when they see me, they know that every day when I'm breathing, it's, it's, it's for us to go farther. You know, every time I speak, I want the truth to come out. His mother, Afeni, had been a Black Panther, and she still believed in the idea of revolution in America. Tupac later said, the phrase Black Power had been like a lullaby when I was a kid. My mother, she would tell me these stories of things she did or saw, and it made me feel part of something. She always raised me to think I was the black prince of the revolution. I was having concerts, they were sold out, white boys, Mexicans, blacks, and they would do whatever I said. I could tell all those people in the audience to turn around in a circle, and they would do it. I was having love, I mean, like, undeniable love. And I was scared. I was scared that I would come to a town and I have the, the, the leader of the gang there telling me, what do you need? I was scared, but so was America. So was somebody else, because all of a sudden I had all kind of legal problems. And you have to think about this. I had a clean record for 20 years, a clean record, living in the ghetto, in the gutter, no record. What about my morals then? What about my character then? You know what I'm saying? In two years that I start raising noise, that I start being publicly viewed, I've had a record. And now it looks like I'm a criminal who has no way of being reformed. I got the whole world fearing me, you know what I'm saying, at 23. Weighing 160 pounds, you know what I'm saying? And I ain't even started. I haven't even rolled my plan out yet, and they scared. I'm, I'm gonna get a lot of flack for it. I think gangs can be positive. Everybody's saying because we choose to be organized now that we are emulating Italians, and we should emulate Italians because they don't like us. Motherfuckers got it twisted, you know what I mean? It just has to be organized. Right. We got organization because we peak game. And it has to stay away from being self-destructive to being self-productive. And it's not the mob, really, that we're seeing. It's really the government. They the biggest mob. This country was built on gangs. That's what we study. Right, right. Governments. Police department, the FBI, the CIA, those are gangs. Mm. These niggas got millions of dollars, institutions set up, like the LAPD, like the feds, like the FBI. All this is they army. And they army make it to where you can inflict your will. I had a correctional officer tell me straight up, we the biggest gang in New York State. That's what we lack, you know what I mean? We don't have no army that's gonna come protect our natural resources because our shit is divided. We just have to not be so self-destructive about it. Organize, you know? This is unity at its finest. Inglewood, California, y'all did this. Los Angeles, y'all did this. This shit make me proud than a motherfucker, man. Y'all just don't know this shit get me emotional, dog. Unity from east side of mother L.A., Crips, Bloods, Power Rules, this shit is special, man. Just showing love and respecting each other. And this is exactly how all our father and soldiers want to see it. We, we said it earlier, like, I, I educated myself. I, I, at one point, I was ignorant and lost, but, like, you got to know yourself before you do anything, before you can make a record, before you can have an opinion. You got to know yourself, so we don't even understand how we connected because, oh, you a blood, I'm from 60s, f you are. You, you from over, I'm from 60s, f you are. You from A-Tray, I'm from 60s, f you. And that's, that's a f up mentality to have. 
But that's the culture of where we come from. You know, this shit been going on for decades. That's why I didn't want to reverse the mind state in our city. And that's what my whole movement is about. You know what I mean? I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you like I love you, and I don't even know you. But I don't, if, I don't, if, if I don't love you, I'm going to tell you whatever. I'm going to tell you what's in my benefit. If I love you, I'm going to tell you what's in your benefit. And repeating the mistakes like us made, the niggas before us and the niggas before them made it, not in your benefit. Bro. So if we do want to live the thug life and the gangster life and all of that, okay, so stop being cowards and let's have a revolution. But we don't want to do that. We can't do for so much marching, y'all. And I know y'all think it's right, but we can't. They not think we've been marching for damn near 100 years. We are marching on the anniversary of when we marched 25 years ago. Love and liberation to you all. And as always, like and follow for more content. Because my mama tell me all the time, boy, you think you're going to save the world. Don't you know they're going to kill your black ass? These people going to bother you. And that's that.